Welcome, and thank you for being here. I'm Gabor Vishki, technology, technology researcher at NATO Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence with a focus on the cybersecurity of uh, ships, modern ships. I'm a PhD student at Taltech. Regarding SICON, I'm the co-chair of the conference and the manager of Technology Track. Today, I'm going to moderate this panel in which, with our distinguished speakers, we will focus on cybersecurity in maritime. Nowadays, the importance of the shipping industry for modern society is constantly growing. More than 90% of the goods across the world are being transported by the sea. The need to reduce the operational costs and the delivery times has led the industry to seeking technological, uh, technological solutions. Along with the growing reliance on autom automation, the risk of external interference and disruption of key systems is greatly increased. Malicious actors can interfer interfere with different control systems of the ship and can cut off external communication or obtain confidential data. Western cybersecurity is recently uh, gaining momentum as a result of a uh, few recent attacks to vessels at sea. But I'm sure there is a lot more to know. In our panel today, our first speaker, Professor Katsikas, will introduce the actual situation and the cyber challenges in the maritime sector. Then we will dig deeper. Dr. Michael Thomas will share his uh, results in his research and discuss the land-based attack scenarios and possible consequences against ships. Finally, retired Colonel uh, Isidoros Monoidis will offer us possible mitigation for cyber threats in the uh, maritime sector. Unfortunately enough, he was not able to uh, join us in person. He will be uh, here remotely. Dear audience, I would like you to address your questions in between the presentations and at the end of them. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Professor Socrates Katsikas, who is the director of the Norwegian Center for Cybersecurity in Critical Sectors and professor at the Department of Information Security and Communication Technology at NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He has authored or co-authored more than 300 journal papers, book chapters, conference papers. He is serving on the editorial board of several scientific journals, has contributed 46 books, and chaired the technical program committee of more than 800 international scientific conferences. He chairs and steering com uh, the Cheering, uh, Steering Committee of uh, SRX conferences, and he is the Editor-in-Chief of the International Journal of Information Security. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gabor. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, uh, Gabor, for both the invitation and the, the warm uh, introduction. Uh, okay, so shall we start the, the slides? Okay, good. So uh, that's just the, the first one. And it's supposed to serve as an introduction to the discussion that we will have uh, uh, later with, uh, with Michael and uh, Isidoros, hopefully. So um, just to, to start with a few words about the Norwegian Center for Cybersecurity in Critical Sectors, uh, which I'm the director of. Uh, it's uh, uh, a research-based innovation center, which is uh, actually a public-private partnership between uh, research uh, institutions and universities in Norway, and several industries in different sectors, critical sectors. All of them actually are critical infrastructures, even though we call them, we call them critical sectors. And uh, the, the idea uh, behind its development is that we create a bridge between our research groups in cybersecurity, 
that exist in NTNU and in our research partners, and what I call the, the real world of industry on the other side. Of course, uh, to non-Norwegians, these uh, logos may not mean much, but uh, those that can identify logos will see that these are partners from the process industry, the defense industry, the uh, power industry, the oil and gas industry, healthcare, and the police, and so on, as well as the security industry. And then there are a number of international collaborators around the world from uh, Asia, Europe, uh, and North America collaborating with us. We started about uh, almost two years ago, and the lifetime of the center is supposed to be uh, eight years after that. It's supposed to be self-sustainable. So uh, one of the, the sectors that we do research in, and remember, it's a research-based innovation uh, center, so it's applied research, uh, is, of course, the, the maritime, maritime sector, even though this is not represented among our industry partners. So um, there is a lot of, of uh, research going on. And, you might wonder why all this fuss about uh, cybersecurity in the in the maritime sector uh, lately. Well, uh, unfortunately, we may like it or not, but usually it's money behind everything. I hate to say that, but as an academic, but unfortunately, this is this is the way it usually is. So, uh, just as an example, uh, Gabor already gave you an indication that 90% of the goods worldwide are transported by ship, right? I hope that I was true. Yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. And, uh, of course, this gives you an indication of the magnitude, the economic magnitude of the industry. So, this is just, you know, a small portion of that uh, in, uh, in Europe. And I will just draw your attention to the fact that the overall contribution of the shipping industry, not the maritime, the, the shipping alone, uh, to the European GDP, is uh, 149, I think, uh, billion uh, euros. Uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, the European GDP is something around 17 trillion. So you can do the math and see that this is a substantial percentage, actually, of the overall European GDP. So this is one of the reasons why interest in the cybersecurity of the, the shipping industry has grown uh, lately. And by lately, I mean, almost 10 years, really. The, one of the first reports, if not the first report that I came across regarding the security of the uh, maritime sector came from ENISA. Those of you not familiar with ENISA, it's the European Network and Information Security Agency. That's the European, uh, European Union uh, agency uh, mandated with uh, supporting cybersecurity uh, activities in uh, member states. So they came up with this report back in November 2011. And the summary or the conclusions of the report was that the, the maritime sector at this time had these challenges with regards to cybersecurity, of course. Uh, so low awareness and focus on the, on the field, on the cybersecurity, the complexity of the ICT environment, Fragmented maritime governance context, inadequate consideration of cybersecurity in maritime regulation, no holistic approach to maritime cyber risks, and overall lack of direct economic incentives to implement good cybersecurity in the maritime sector. Question to you, how many of these challenges have we really addressed in the past 11 years? How good do you think we are doing? <laughs> Are we doing well? Are we doing, can we do better? Are we doing terribly? Yeah, well, no volunteers, I understand. This is just after lunch. So I'll give you a hint. <laughs> okay. uh, well, this is how the, uh, the shipping industry itself perceives how they are doing. And this comes, actually, you don't see the answers here. You only see the questions. Uh, I was... Uh, I, I missed the slide, Gabor, when I sent you the slides, and then it was too late for me to introduce the answers as well. But I have, I have a piece of paper, so I'll tell you the answers. So this was a, a survey done by Lloyd's List on how the shipping industry themselves perceive how they are doing the cybersecurity. So, do we have more attacks? The answer is yes, we do have more attacks. We know that, right? But what is the severity of attacks? Mind you, the perceived 
severity of attacks. Well, only 10% are perceived to be severe, 31% are supposed to be significant, 52% are supposed to be or perceived to be minor, and, and this is the most alarming to me, 7% responded unsure, not certain. Do you agree that this is the most alarming fact? Because if you know that you have sustained an attack and you're not able to assess the impact that the attack had, alias its severity, that's too bad, really, because it seems, it means that you don't really know how good you're doing with cybersecurity or not, right? Okay. Are we doing enough? Well, 57% of them say that they could do better. We could do better. And only 26% are satisfied. I don't know the correlation between this 26% and the 7% that were unsure about the severity of attacks. But it would, it would have been interesting to know. Coming to training, because of course it is a well-known fact that uh, uh, one of the crucial factors in improving the cybersecurity statute of any organization or posture, posture of any organization, regardless of the, uh, of the sector, is to improve the training, right? Well, 54% of the shipping, uh, of the ship owners responded that they do provide cybersecurity training, which is not bad, but it can be, it can be better. And then, to the question whether there are measures in place in the event of an attack, 63% said yes. Of course, the question was not specific enough, because yes, of course the shipping industry has measures in case of an incident, but do they have measures against cyber attacks in particular? Michael, I think this is something you will uh, pick up, uh, perhaps. Yep. And then, no measures at all, 16%. And again, unsure, 21%. So they don't know. Do we have measures? Oh, sorry, don't know. And finally, of course, insurance. Great, 69% are satisfied. Sure. Then where is the economic incentive to do something about cybersecurity? If you think, if you believe that you're insured against almost everything, that's great. Then you don't have to invest in cybersecurity, right? Okay. Now, what's the situation uh, today? Uh, this, uh, in these uh, two slides, this one and the next, maybe three, I'm not sure, I'm following a report uh, that has been issued by Norma Cyber. Uh, Norma is the Norwegian Maritime Cyber Resilience Center. It is a center which has been established by ownership of many major shipping companies in Norway, uh, and they are issuing annual report. So the annual threat assessment for 2022 will give us a good, uh, a good picture of the landscape as it stands today. And among the, the threat actors that we identify, and this does not only apply to Norway, that's why I'm just using this as a guide, right? Uh, of course, nation states, we have cyber criminals, and we have hacktivists as well. In fact, I don't think that we have any recorded incident of hacktivism in the maritime sector, but everyone agrees that it's a question of time rather than if something like that will, will happen eventually. But of course, uh, these days, what is on, on stage are nation states and uh, cyber criminals with uh, the, the goal of monetization of, of an attack. Uh, and what kind of threats are identified as, as relevant? Uh, again, I followed the structure of the, of the threat report, and uh, that means that I've uh, followed also the order in which the threats appear. This is not uh, any hierarchical order here, meaning that the first one is more important than the, than the last one, uh, but it somehow reflects the uh, perception of the importance of such attacks. And it was quite a surprise to me that the first one on top uh, was the espionage uh, threat. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a surprise because I had never thought of espionage in the, in the maritime sector uh, as one really very uh, strong threat. But it appears to be that we do have evidence that there, there have been incidents like that more uh, 
possibly well known among them, an incident with a Soviet uh, ship, a research ship. I think the name was Academic Lazarev. That was caught following the pipelines, the oil pipelines between Norway and the UK. Uh, because, I mean, the AIS track of the, of the ship was uh, analyzed and it was found that it was following the, the pipelines. And, of course, anyone can think why this, this was happening. Obviously, it was not part of an exercise to see whether they can navigate uh, well enough to be able to follow the pipelines. Then we have, of course, the supply chain attacks, the usual ones, not anything specific to the maritime sector, but there have been incidents because of the supply to the well-known supply chain attacks in the maritime sector, exploitation of well-known vulnerabilities as well. Then uh, malware delivery is, is common as the first step in the uh, cyber kill chain of any, uh, of any uh, attack. And unfortunately, because of the poor training, not only of, uh, of crews, but also of the staff in the uh, uh, land bases of the maritime sector is, is quite poor in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, this uh, method of malware delivery by uh, social engineering techniques seems to be quite, uh, quite successful. Um, then, of course, credential uh, harvesting after the, the malware delivery is, uh, is happening, and therefore that means that attackers have the, uh, the opportunity to uh, get into the, into the, uh, the systems of the, of the attack. Um, whether it's known or not, there have been incidents, even though we have not been able to attribute them, uh, of phishing through Inmarsat Sea communications. And in fact, uh, this was actually related to credential harvesting. So there have been attacks, phishing attacks. Uh, someone or some some ones are trying to uh, map crew credentials and ship uh, credentials through um, communications through Inmarsat Sea, uh, particularly through the, the pandemic, when, of course, this communication was... Uh, uh, was more useful for delivering news and so on. And in fact, the cybersecurity of the satellite infrastructure is something that we have not paid enough attention to, I think. But it's coming up as one of the issues that need to be looked upon, not necessarily in the maritime sector itself, but in a more generic context. And then, of course, we have uh, fraud, mostly through uh, business, uh, business emails, uh, fake emails, and financial fraud, and then, of course, the well-known uh, ransomware uh, cases. Now, I'm usually very bad at keeping time, so please shout, Gabor. I, I will help you towards the time. <laughs> Good. But I think <laughs> this is my last one, so I'm not so bad, not so yeah. terrible, eventually. Excellent. So, uh, if I go back to the first slide, then... I mean, to the slide with the challenges identified by Enisa 11 years ago, I would say, yeah, okay, there is some progress, but there is still way to go before we can say that we've met those challenges. But unfortunately, or fortunately for us security experts, there are more challenges coming up. And some of them, first of all, they derive because of more digitalization, right? Nowadays, we're speaking of shipping 4.0 the equivalent of Industry 4.0 initiative in, in the shipping area, right? And one important aspect of this process is the integration of IT and OT. Not the convergence, as many people say, because convergence has happened at least 15 years ago when OT started using IT, but now we have an integration of that. And the situation with this is very similar to what had happened more than 20 years ago when information technologies and communication technologies were integrated and we were forced to change the paradigm that we were using for cybersecurity. Moving from closed systems that we had to protect against the bad guys to open systems that would be accessible to everyone and then we had to change our mindset into transformation to trust rather than lists of people that could access the closed systems. So something like that is happening again. But I think it's even more difficult because information technology people were always aware of communication technology and vice versa. But unfortunately, 
those that are very good in IT and IT security are usually quite unknowledgeable about OT and again vice versa. We simply don't speak the same languages. There are very few that can understand both worlds. This is a very major challenge. Another one is, of course, autonomous vessels. We are already seeing several of those in several applications, and they do carry their own cybersecurity uh, challenges far more enhanced and advanced than those of conventional uh, vessels. And, of course, another variation of autonomous vessels are the remotely operated vessels. And again, this is an area where we need to do, uh, to do more. The final one, I've just used one word, underwater. There is so much going on underwater now, and there is so little that we are doing to secure what we call the internet of underwater things, that this is a vast area that uh, we need to pay attention uh, to. And this is really a very, very uh, uh, challenging area of, uh, of research uh, for us. There is a lot to do, and hopefully we will be able to do that before any major incident happens. I'm not only saying about underwater, but the maritime sector uh, in general. I'm usually optimistic, so I'm not saying that an incident will happen, but it may. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your very nice uh, presentation. I, uh, we agreed before the panel we will not dance around, but still, we can change any time. <laughs> well, uh, we are ready for your questions, if you do have any. Yes, please, uh, gentlemen. Jan? Sir, please, Erwin. Yes, uh, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, you're right, of course. Uh, I should have mentioned that this, uh, well, being a list, uh, a survey by Lloyd's List, it is about, of course, mer uh, merchant uh, maritime sector, so uh, no uh, war shipping uh, involved. And I'm sure that the perception is, is very, much, uh, very much different between the civilian and the military uh, sector, uh, sector there. I wouldn't have any, any data, any hard data on the, the military uh, sector, but of course uh, I would definitely expect it to be much, much higher than what it is in the civilian sector. Yep. Thank you. Okay, then I will address a question that I'm uh, really curious about. So we are ad advancing with the autonomy, so the weakest point, the people, is out of the, out of the loop, more or less, mm -hmm. but the automation is heavily growing. More and more IT and auto systems are installed on the autonomous ships. How do you, how do you predict the shifting of the uh, cyber issues? Do you think that uh, we will have more and more uh, uh, incidents in the, in the area of uh, autonomous shipping, or will we have less because the autonomous ships are designed by secu uh, being secured? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question, actually, uh, Gabor, thanks. Uh, and maybe we should, we should discuss this not uh, in the narrow context of the maritime sector, but I think that whatever I will say as an answer will apply to more general industry, but let's keep it to the maritime sector, right? Uh, to answer this concretely, uh, I would say that what we need to know is what percentage of the incidents are due to human error, right? And of course, the, uh, the reasoning that if we exclude if 
the percentage of incidents that are due to human error is quite high. And then if we do exclude the human factor from the loop, then that would automatically mean that we should expect less incidents. But is this reasoning really correct? What I would think, and again, no hard data, right? This is just a, uh, an intuition. Uh, yes, these kinds of incidents would be reduced. But then there is an additional question that needs to be asked. Would there be any additional incidents that would not have occurred if we had a human in the loop and would occur because we don't have a human in the loop? Let me give you a very naive example, right? Imagine one of the well-known uh, cybersecurity attacks against uh, navigation. Actually, the two most known attacks are GNSS spoofing and jamming, right? And uh, AIS, tampering with uh, AIS uh, data. And in fact, you did showcase <laughs> an attack with AIS in the workshop on, on Tuesday, right? So. Let's take the scenario that you have an autonomous ferry, no human involved, right? And suddenly someone launches an attack with a few hundred fake AIS trails in the Trondheim fjord, right? Great scenario. What would the system do with today's technology, right? Or if the AIS was spoofed so that it showed the location of the vessel on the shore, rather than in the sea, right? With today's technology, not much. Of course, we are working towards that, right? So that we can use AI techniques and so on to recognize that something is wrong, but we couldn't be able to do much. It's the human operator on board the ship that knows that this cannot be correct, right? So to recap, I think we would be having less incidents that are due to the human factor, naturally, but we would be having different incidents that we don't have today. Now, quantitatively, whether the latter would be more or more severe than the, the former, I can't know. But I don't think that this is something that should stop us or uh, slower the pace of automation, because there are so many advantages. Thank you. Well, I've been considering that uh, going to to an autonomous ship with my with my uh, motorboat and with fake AIS messages, uh, stealing it. But uh, this attack would be uh, from the sea. But uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Thomas, brought uh, scenarios the, in which the attacks are uh, addressed from the land. So. Let's uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the problems. Thank you. And let's dig deeper. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Michael Thomas, who is a retired colonel and currently assigned to Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama, as a professor of cyber, uh, cyber warfare studies. Previously, he was served at Naval uh, Information Warfare Center as an IC, uh, C4 ISR system engineer in communication and network division, and was responsible for design, implementation, and f uh, fielding of major systems engineering project for US Navy. He served in several offices, like at the Pentagon, at the Joint Special Operations Command, and at the Air Force Institution of uh, Technology. Mike, the floor is yours. Please introduce your Results. Thank you, Gabor. <clears throat> thank you for the nice introduction, and thank you for attending. The topic is going to float between both the military and the civilian sector, uh, because a lot of them have things in common. Just as there are things in common between uh, platform technology in the Air Force and platform technology in the Navy. The current Navy shipbuilding has had some issues. Um, ship classes have been cut, uh, vessels retired early, uh, many are waiting years for repairs. Uh, the LCS, the littoral combat ship, uh, has been an example of the adoption of tech and tech failing. The Zumwalt class stealth destroyer is being cut back from a plan 32 to only three, and the implementation of a railgun on board 
has been abandoned. Ford class carriers have got all sorts of issues with catapults, radars, elevators, uh, cost overruns. Shipbuilding capacity has been minimized. There is a quality to quantity, and right now the People's Republic of China is outbuilding us, and us, I say, the U.S. Historically, a nation's rise and decline has been directly linked to the power of its navy. Um, the current world order was established at the end of World War II with the United States guaranteeing the freedom of the seas and encouraging Britain, the France, um, not to rebuild their navies and begin another arms race in the maritime sector, that we would guarantee freedom of the seas for them and they could do their uh, world trade under our banner. The, um, the issue of the size of the Navy has, has been discussed in the past. At the end of World War II, we had 6,000 ships in the Navy. Reagan bankrupted um, or convinced the Soviet Union that they could never outspend us by only wanting 600 ships in the Navy. Right now, we've got about 350 ships, and the proposal has been uh, to increase that to 450 ships. What kind of platforms are we talking about? Stated earlier, 90% of the world's traffic in commercial traffic is done at sea. Um, 90 to 95%, depending on the statistic, of the internet, international internet, is under the sea. So the sea is very important to the current information environment. And there was a major study in, 19, in 2019 that talked about almost 60 open source incidents uh, involving only the components of the integrated bridge system, that IP-based network on the bridge that has both data and connectivity uh, to the outside world. Uh, examples of this uh, has been by either disabling and spoofing AIS uh, by Russia, Iran, and North Korea uh, due to masking movements. Uh, there was an article in the, in the news feeds this morning about the shipping of oil and the Russians using the same techniques as the North Koreans to turn their AIS and GPS off running dark to trans transport uh, ship oil, if, uh, sanctioned oil, from a Russian vessel to a non-Russian vessel, uh, even for sale in the U.S. Um, NGA has provided uh, maritime charts to the U.S. Navy and to uh, com the commercial sector, but not all the charts are of the same quality. And in fact, the electronic charting system on board uh, using bad uh, data has shown some vulnerabilities uh, both to HTML injects or uh, outmoded operating systems on board. Jamming GPS is not difficult to do. And in fact, the um, uh, power of a GPS signal is said to be about that of a 25 watt bulb. Uh, the sensitivity of the receiver is what's important. Uh, data indexed at GPS using poorly secured SATCOM terminals on board uh, that might be linked to uh, the GPS enabled autopilot on board a ship it has created problems. The USS Guardian uh, in naval history had inaccurate uh, NGA data loaded on their electronic charts. It caused it to run aground. Uh, the USS John McCain, uh, faulty nav, uh, poor sailoring, poor manning, and poor equipment implementation as well. Finally, the USS Donald Cook uh, had their GPS jammed by a Russian aircraft. So it happens. Let's take a look real quick. Yeah, we'll watch the first minute and a half of this. Do I have sound on this? No. There, there is a, an audio track to this as well. Maybe you need to be out of presentation mode for it to play, Mike. Uh, no, it'll, it'll no? play in, it'll play in okay. presentation mm -hmm. mode. Okay. There's a, there's a uh, uh, if you go down to the bottom of the screen, there's a toolbar on the far left, and, right. it, sh and it should appear All right, go out, go out of presentation mode for a second.
Do we have audio? I think uh, we do have, but uh, I think uh, we have to check uh, the details. No, there's, a, there's an audio, there's a video embedded in the slide. And if you click on the body of the slide, it'll begin yep. playing. Yep. It's only a picture. You see, it's a presentation, and we have to deal with huge, huge ships. So. Okay, sorry. <laughs> That's a challenge. I expected the audio. The, anyway, the, the audio is a story that was on CNBC. Go back to the presentation then of that slide, and I'll, I'll continue. That showed the uh, NSA was training college students to um, um, <coughs> hack integrated bridge system technology. And one of the young students reflected on uh, how much damage in the economy they could do to a country. All right, what does the attack surface in the ship look like? Um, navigation data can be in the cloud. You've got port infrastructure, mainland computer systems at the companies, um, all sorts, routes, procedures, and personnel. Who are the bad actors? As my colleague earlier mentioned, uh, nation states, rival companies, Criminals, pirates, are independent freelance hackers, and then, of course, insiders as well. A little bit of history. Um, typically, the, uh, if we look at the top, the cyber interacts Industry 3.0 and Industry 4.0 was when we started seeing uh, automated systems introduced, first as SCADA, then as IT link to SCADA. This is another uh, video. I would love to see these dots moving, but apparently they're not going to do it. Each dot being a ship, and each ship having uh, different systems on board in different sets of systems. Um, the bridge system being composed, of course, of AIS, uh, the charting, GPS, gyro compass, radar, and weather. Tampering with any of those can have very deleterious effects on the outcome. Um, the problem also happens to be when you cross the navigation into the marine systems or the propulsion and steering. Um, cyber attacks on board a vessel often occur because those systems are no longer segregated. Companies wanting minimal manning and wanting to check, in, check the um, status of where a ship is and how it's performing will often go through the IP-based network uh, across the bus into the control systems to look at fuel consumption, uh, performance, if they're monitoring the ballast properly, and create, a, create an issue. GPS simulators can be uh, purchased for very little money and used as a platform to inject an ASCII character, 12 to 18 uh, ASCII characters, through the SATCOM uh, and tell a, a ship that would normally be ready to turn left. For example, you change the L to an R and it turns right. It's been demonstrated on a container ship back in 1918. Pentest partners showed that access into the steering, uh, steering and throttle was possible uh, using such an approach. Um, again, the volume of global tonnage. Uh, we can believe uh, back in March 2021, when the Ever Given was jammed inside the Suez Canal, the disruption on global trade that was felt. And for a short time, uh, the impact uh, was known and was being paid attention to. Um, there was another attack on a merchant vessel in June of 2019. Um, cyber attack, they're not sure if it was uh, targeted by hackers or if one of the crew entertainment uh, IT-based products had malware injected uh, accidentally or intentionally by the crew. Um, but it was a deep draft vessel bound for New York, and it was totally debilitated by malware. They had to fly a, 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 white, a white team crew out and actually basically reboot the, reboot the ship. Um, we publish data uh, online. Um, depending on the size of the ship, 
a ship may have to ping every five, four or five seconds its location and heading uh, and speed, and that's um, broadcast on an open network uh, for the world to see. So the information is there. Target selection is a possibility. What the Ever Given provided was the idea that block ships could come back in vogue, a block ship being something that was uh, blocking a channel. Uh, the Russian Navy did this as early as 2014, as recently as 2014, when they sunk a derelict vessel uh, at the bay in Crimea and basically trapped most of the Ukrainian Navy taking possession of it. Um, if we look at the red circle, uh, April 1st, 2021, uh, we see what is called a, a Navy task force uh, heading towards the Suez Canal. This is immediately after the Ever Given has been refloated. As we start to move it, by April 8th, it is through the canal and on its mission, on the way to its mission further in the Persian Gulf. And then finally, by the 15th, it's on station uh, just outside the Persian Gulf uh, for counter piracy maneuvers. Um, this is a view from the USS Monterey, part of the Eisenhower strike group uh, that was displayed on the charts. Uh, imagine being stuck uh, in the canal with a block ship and then being targeted uh, by people with floating bombs. Uh, it would totally eliminate the success of this mission uh, that occurred in May, where they grabbed a lot of Russian-made anti-tank weapons uh, en route for somewhere. But, but basically what would happen is that you could establish three separate kill zones, north in the Great uh, Bitter Lake and then south, uh, with traffic backed up. And in fact, this is exactly what happened to the USS Cole back in 12 October. A small uh, floating uh, floating bomb got close enough to take out a piece of it. The ship was able to be recovered, taken back and rebuilt, and is still in service. But a determined enemy uh, using this vector of attack could disable either uh, military or civilian shipping. This one scenario, protection of pipelines and subsea cables has been proposed. Um, people have to know where the subsea cables are. We advertise where they are because we don't want ships running into them, running over them, fishermen dropping their anchors on top of them, um, disrupts the internet. But in fact, uh, not too long ago, uh, there was an occurrence of a ship uh, subsea cable being cut between the northern coast of Norway and Svalbard uh, that disrupted internet traffic. Uh, interesting, it took out one but didn't take out the other one. Uh, another scenario, uh, cyber-enabled attacks against shipping and shore-based infrastructure. Um, some of this has been occurring in the run-up to the Ukraine war where LNG tankers in the U.S. were actually targeted uh, and disrupted. Um, an LNG tanker, again, a uh, floating vessel with high-pressure tanks, um, lots of uh, kinetic energy, potential energy stored in that compressed gas, uh, the concerns of LNG tanker accidents in the Boston Channel has been documented over and over again in the last 50 years. Um, with the current technology, if a, an LNG tanker were jammed or taken control um, in a populated area, you could potentially have nuclear effects without having a weapon of mass destruction. Boston Channel, again, uh, shows some of the uh, affected areas that would be in there. Um, Cyber-enabled underwater weapons. Um, targets abound. Examples are pipe, pipelines coming from North Africa supplying uh, hydrocarbons to southern Europe. In real life, again, uh, Russia has been attributed to having had something to do with the subsea cable cut. Uh, and it's not just Russia. France has, in fact, uh, created a strategy for underwater warfare and is prepared uh, to move forward with this capability in the coming decade. Shooting and blocking dangerous exercises. Again, once a ship is under control of some uh, 
negative party, uh, how are they going to handle it? What are they going to do with it? Uh, a control zone outside, one of the islands in open water. Again, uh, oh, the graphic didn't come through either. Uh, Beijing has got lots of uh, encroachments into other areas of the South China Sea. Um, so some tactical advice for maritime cybersecurity. We'll look at tactical, operational, and strategic. Um, make sure your, I, your AIS uh, is secured, your SATCOM is secured, your IP-based network uh, is secured. Um, crew and the Wi-Fi are, and business networks are logically separated. There's no need to have your crew email system connected to the rest of the bridge. Um, USB ports secured. This is all basic stuff. Uh, check on board for the Wi-Fi networks. Don't over-rely on technology. Um, that was part of the problem with the McCain. The bridge crew thought they were where they weren't uh, and ended up running into a container ship. Teach your crew about cybersecurity. Um, that's going to be a difficult one with the number of people on the vessels and the crew rotations um, that occur. Technology suppliers uh, have to prove to you that they are secure. Uh, you shouldn't have to be doing it all by yourself. Um, there are companies out there that will do a cybersecurity audit for you. This is something before you allow a vessel into your waters, legislation can be introduced uh, so that it is safe. It, can, it has to prove that it's safe to be in those waters. Operational advice has been put out by BIMCO. Uh, you know, a cyber risk management approach in, in a uh, multi-stage environment. But again, uh, develop the philosophy for the vessel design, design for robustness, and then of course system resilience. Um, operational advice, again, you've got to look at the entire package in a system of systems approach. So the, the Atlantic Council came out with strategic advice for the implementation uh, of policy legislation, uh, large-scale measures that should be adopted globally, and more, more strategic advice. Eventually, we're going to a more remote control environment for floating vessels. It's going to be a problem. The navies of the world, as well as the commercial sectors, have adopted this as a means of keeping the number of floating platforms up to have increased capability. Um, in fact, the Navy just introduced a uh, new uh, float, a new, new subcommand uh, to be held in uh, Navwar in Dahlgren that will, in fact, be in charge of uh, floating, uh, floating vessels, automated vessels. Uh, one test result a year ago from DARPA, they sailed um, a 50-foot vessel from San Diego to Honolulu and back with no one on board. So. The technology, both in warships and in commercial shipping, is on the, on the rise. So Dunning-Kruger always like it. We started at the peak of Mount Stupid. Um, halfway through, maybe we started having some hope. All the way through the slides, uh, we've become a little bit more enlightened. But sometime in the future, driven by mission requirements, we're going to have to have some way uh, and definition of what a sustainment for these new automated uh, platforms are going to be. And if no one has got questions, that's the end of my material. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for your excellent uh, presentation and the brief overview. Well, I'm not scared, I knew about it, but uh, I think that uh, our audience might wish to address some questions. Please. In the back. Thought I saw a hand up. Okay. Uh, two questions pop up in my mind. Uh, how do you estimate uh, how confident the sector is and how clever the sector is right now on the uh, Dunning Clark graph? In which stage we are? Oh, um, we're in the nation stages of implementation and security. Uh, it's 
largely been ignored um, because most people just want to go to the beach. They don't want to think about the industrial controls and the IP-based controls uh, necessary to have safe, a safe maritime working environment. Um, if you think of uh, the number of incidents in private homes and in businesses, um, there's still a, a market for uh, people wanting to create havoc. So it's an extension of that into a moving environment at sea. Yeah, please, Ackman. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question regarding the training in maritime. As I, I, uh, I'm observing that the current trend is to train maritime personnel and people working in maritime, teach them cybersecurity. Uh, and there still is a lack of, as I have of, uh, witnessed, lack of uh, skillful people uh, in cybersecurity in the maritime domain. How can we, or is it possible, or is it feasible, to do the other way, which is teaching maritime affairs and concepts and uh, the aspects of the maritime industry to people in cybersecurity. There's a lot of people knowing IT, knowing OT security, but they have no idea about maritime and what is needed to secure maritime system. Would this be something useful or how can it be? Um, let, me, let me tell a story and then tell another story. Last August at DEF CON, uh, they have a hack the hack the sea competition. Uh, the, the 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 goal is to win the black ba coveted black badge. Um, a team with only land-based skills uh, was able to plug in and take control of both the de the uh, integrated bridge simulator as well as steering and throttle within a, within a few hours. Um, it doesn't take a lot for clever people to look at systems and see what they do, uh, particularly systems that um, maybe 15, 20 years old weren't designed with security in And I'm talking that lower section of the integrated um, uh, controls that, that would be called SCADA or ICS on land. Um, the second, um, there's a guy named Joe Weissman. Uh, he's an expert in uh, cybersecurity. Marine, maritime Cybersecurity, uh, did a talk for us on our virtual cyber seminar series uh, and said that the internet of things that help run a ship, uh, the pumps, uh, the motors and whatnot, um, are not built with any type of cybersecurity built into them at all. And the people that design them don't know the language of cybersecurity. So some of it can be very, very easy. Some of it can be very, very difficult. Other questions? I think that uh, you have a better overview on the, on the sector. Uh, so that's always a good excuse. OK, our technology is old. We cannot uh, introduce any cybersecurity measure. At the same time, International Maritime Organization uh, made compulsory the cyber assessment for ships. Uh, how do you see in your country? Is, are these uh, recommendations followed or just omitted and told that, OK, the technology is old? There, there are some, um, um, some good steps being taken and recommendations being made. Um, but even um, uh, off the east coast of Africa, you've got legitimate commercial haulers turning off their AIS so that Somali pirates won't, um, won't be able to identify them uh, for target selection. Uh, the Russians uh, turn theirs off for the sake of sanctions avoidance. The North Koreans turn theirs off in the, um, for the sake of uh, uh, sanctions avoidance. We know they're out there. Uh, reports, 1,000-page reports are generated every year by the United Nations. Uh, the question becomes, what incentivizes the rest of the industry to do something about it? And I don't have the answer to that. Yep. You mentioned Russia several times. Uh, how can the sector attribute the attacks? Well, it, it, you know, it's interesting. Using uh, geoint uh, and satellite-based technology, most uh, freighters of a certain length and a certain width have something the equivalent of a, figure, of a fingerprint in the way the deck is configured. Antennas, where the bridge is, uh, where hard structures are placed, 
So a ship can be identified relatively accurately and then can be tracked from space. So an integration of uh, uh, geo-enabled uh, geo tracking uh, for that, uh, as well as uh, keeping track of the ship uh, when, it, when it meets up with another vessel, does the cross-platform transfer the sanctioned goods, and then tracking where it, where it goes, either to North Korea or uh, even some to the United States. I see. But in the land case attacks, it would be a more challenging task, right? Yeah. Well, there's all smuggling. Smuggling is what we're talking about. High tech smuggling. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. I hope and believe uh, you preserved some questions for the uh, very end. And uh, let's keep moving. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Isidorios uh, Monoyoudis who is a retired colonel from the Greek Armed Forces with more than 20 years experience in critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. Before his retirement, he was the head of cyber defense operations in the Greek military of defense, involved in several projects for incident response, security assessment, red teaming, cyber defense exercises, and many more. After his retirement, he worked for the UK-based security vendor as a cyber security architect focused on the threat intelligence and its integration with other security solutions. Since July 2021, he works as a project officer for European Defense Agency, managing research projects for information technologies and cyber defense. Isidorius, welcome you. You are online. We can see you. I hope and believe that we can hear you. Please introduce your opinion how to solve the problem that was uh, uh, figured out right now. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, first of all, apologies for not being there physically. Uh, before moving on, please confirm that you can hear me well. Yes, 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 perfect. Okay, perfect. So, um, again, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's uh, really a very, uh, it's an honor to participate in the conference. Uh, several years ago, I was attending uh, as a, a participant, uh, in the, even from the first SICON, back if I remember 10 or 12 years ago. Um, Anyway, before uh, moving on, please uh, allow me to share my screen. Uh, first, uh, first of all, to introduce myself, as I, uh, you mentioned, I'm a retired colonel uh, and uh, currently uh, involved in the European Defense Agency managing uh, research and technology and innovation projects in cyber and information technology. Before that, uh, I had the opportunity to work also in the private sector that gave me also the opportunity to get involved in projects related to maritime cybersecurity uh, with uh, the experience that I can share with you uh, in my presentation that will try to address, to identify what we can do, what are the mitigation uh, measures for uh, addressing the challenges that have been identified uh, so far. So let me share my presentation. Let's hope technology will help us. Okay, can you please confirm that you can see my slide in full? Yes, please, please. Okay. We can Thank see you. your slide. Perfect. So, mitigating the cyber threat in maritime sector. What are the key principles uh, for uh, uh, cyber security for mitigation of the threats? Uh, initially, just to say that I will not uh, try to use any new... ...known, already worked and applied in the uh, land, the traditional, let's say, cybersecurity area. So what we need actually in the maritime sector is to tailor, to customize technology and processes to be applicable in the specific environment of maritime sector. So what are the key principles? Is to identify the threat, which is something that uh, my colleagues already, the uh, previous uh, speakers have already addressed that. It was part of the uh, work of the, of the panel. Uh, risk management, detect and protect, respond and recover, secure architecture, user awareness and training, and security compliance. 
Let's move on one by one. So by risk management, which is actually includes uh, the identification of threats, uh, we can uh, see that uh, those are uh, the four uh, key uh, elements that uh, consist of the risk management. First of all, uh, and especially for maritime, we need an asset inventory and uh, sufficient asset management uh, uh, system. Why? Because uh, one of the biggest problems in maritime sector in the specific industry is to know uh, our to know their assets. Uh, many times, uh, failures uh, or uh, incidents uh, come from uh, devices that are uh, forgotten, that are missed, not something new to the cybersecurity domain, as we all know, but in the shipping industry, combined uh, the land, uh, the shore, the port, and the uh, vessels uh, technology, uh, there are uh, assets that are forgotten. Also, more uh, specifically and more importantly, in the OT uh, area, operational technology assets also need to be uh, monitored and managed uh, continuously because of their sensitivity and their uh, uh, impact in case of uh, any security incident. Gap analysis. We need to identify the technology and administrative gaps. Uh, every shipping uh, industry in the maritime sector need to know what are the gaps. They need to know where the threat comes uh, from either for uh, their offices or uh, from the ship and the vessels uh, themselves. Then we need to assess the risk, to identify the risk and assess the risks. Many times uh, uh, we can see that there is a poor risk assessment uh, in the, the maritime sector. Uh, I have seen risk assessment that just consists of a five to six uh, major global, let's say, transparent uh, uh, risks that do not actually apply to the specific environment. So uh, risk identification is something that uh, requires a lot of effort and uh, focus for each uh, CPIC uh, industry. Uh, it's time. Risk treatment, not only identify the risks, but also to define security controls that will mitigate its identified risk. Again, as I told you, it's not something new, but uh, what I have seen uh, from my previous experience in the private sector, it is something that does not uh, uh, perform well, it does not perform uh, sufficiently, meaning that uh, at the end, uh, shipping owners and the management uh, uh, at the management level, do not know why they need to invest on cybersecurity technology and people. Detect and protect. Again, we are following the guidelines from NIST, okay, the overall principles in cybersecurity. Uh, in order to uh, be able to protect our systems, we need to detect the threat. Uh, some key points for detect and protection are the following. Endpoint detection technology. Currently, uh, we can see that technology offers advanced uh, endpoint detection and response solutions, uh, agent-based technology that can be uh, installed and applied to every IIT system, both uh, offshore and uh, on board, uh, that can give uh, uh, sufficient protection uh, and uh, uh, in terms of uh, detection and response to the IT systems uh, and also to some of the OT. Uh, that means that uh, in maritime sector, uh, shipping industry can rely on that advanced technology because it offers advanced automation and uh, must more, much more uh, sufficient uh, protection for cyber, from cyber threats. Vulnerability management, again, some uh, critical uh, issue that requires continuous assessment and mitigation prioritization including uh, operational technology. Uh, I have uh, the opportunity to see some uh, new uh, technology solutions in terms of, uh, in the context of vulnerability management and vulnerability assessment, solutions and software that include uh, operational technology assets and that, uh, and uh, which also based on some specific recommended architecture can also work on board uh, for vessels that even during uh, uh, shipping, during sailing, can provide sufficient vulnerability detection and management. They use cloud technology and they have the, also the capacity and the technology to, uh, to work in the isolated, in an isolated environment like a vessel.
Uh, either way, we all understand how important it is to detect uh, vulnerabilities early enough to mitigate the potential threats. Real-time situational awareness, again, something really critical that involves collection, process, and analysis of digital asset security information. What security information? We are talking about logs. We are talking about everything that uh, could provide the cyber hygiene of every digital asset, uh, especially on board. And this is something critical because management uh, usually takes place from the headquarter. So the IT and security team need to know for every visual uh, the security uh, status, uh, but uh, in, in real time. Uh, of course, it's not uh, easy. However, now technology and current internet bandwidth and solutions offer that kind of uh, uh, solution, that kind of uh, capacity to uh, collect, uh, send data uh, to uh, a management uh, central management console that could uh, efficiently uh, process and analyze the data, providing to uh, to the security team. Uh, the right uh, picture. Threat intelligence. This is something uh, really important and global uh, because that will uh, drive uh, how we can detect and uh, respond to cyber uh, attacks. Uh, maritime, and based on uh, what we have seen lately, we can see that there is an increased number of cyber threats and cyber attacks, successful cyber attacks. So we need to communicate uh, how these uh, have been uh, uh, successfully performed, what are the mitigation measures, and what we can do to share information uh, for uh, successfully mitigating the threats. Patch management, really important and really difficult. Prioritization and patching the vulnerable systems, it is not really a straightforward, even in the traditional uh, IT uh, area. Uh, we can understand that there are a lot of old systems in the uh, shipping uh, sector, in the maritime sector, that makes any patching uh, process really hard and really difficult, especially for uh, uh, systems uh, that are on business, that are on board, and we cannot uh, properly test them and make the right uh, process. So it is something that is really a headache in the maritime sector, but still needs to be addressed uh, properly. Respond and recover, something uh, really important in uh, uh, the uh, domain, in the, in the security domain that involves uh, incident management plan and incident response capabilities. And here it is where uh, CPIC industry and maritime sector needs to identify how they can deliver those uh, capabilities. Most likely, and uh, it is uh, something well realized, it's not uh, a capacity that can be developed in-house. Uh, maritime sector and many and more and more uh, shipping companies uh, nowadays uh, put that uh, in an outsourced uh, approach, uh, mainly using a security operation uh, center as a service that includes incident response uh, capabilities and capacity. Of course, in the previous uh, uh, approach, in the previous principle, the detect and uh, uh, respond and detected uh, and respond, it also involves uh, the engagement of a security operations center, mainly outsourced. Either way, what we need to communicate, what we need to understand is that it is a priority. It is important to have a 24-7 coverage uh, that will provide to the CPIC industry uh, the right uh, capacity and capabilities to respond to cyber attacks because it's not uh, uh, protection and uh, preactive, uh, proactive measures will not sufficiently uh, prevent uh, uh, cyber attacks from uh, being uh, happen. Disaster recovery and business continuity plans are plans that have their own maturity level in the maritime sector in terms of uh, physical security. Uh, we know that there are plans that uh, uh, provide the right measures uh, even against uh, piracy and so on. Uh, so we need also to tailor those uh, backup uh, plans uh, uh, to uh, perform uh, proper backup and restore the systems and to make sure that shipping operations can be restored uh, when they are impacted, uh, when they have an impact by a cyber attack. Uh, we need to know how the IT and OT work uh, 
uh, properly and how they can be restored because the major concern in the uh, maritime uh, industry, in the maritime sector, is the impact in the OT assets uh, since uh, any uh, disruption there could mean uh, quite significant uh, damage. Other aspects in terms of mitigation, uh, the cyber threats uh, are the following that include secured architecture uh, with the key uh, principle, the network segmentation. We have seen in the past that uh, there are systems, uh, especially on board on vessels where IT and OT systems are not separated, are not physically separated, meaning that they can provide a vulnerable path for cyber attacks to be uh, performed. So starting from that, from the network segmentation, a secure architecture needs to be applied involving also other subnetting principles that will make sure that uh, access is being granted only to those who have the right permissions and the right authorization. Strong identity and access management, something really important in every, uh, globally in the security domain. So even more in the maritime sector, we need a strong authentication process for every digital asset. We have seen many uh, incidents, uh, especially on board from uh, different audits where passwords uh, were just uh, on a stick uh, uh, and um, uh, passwords uh, with uh, uh, common accounts, with a common password and other very poor authentication systems. And that's why in a recent uh, guideline from uh, US Coast Guard, uh, the first, uh, uh, let's say, uh, guide instruction was to use a password for each account. I know it sounds really trivial, but uh, in 2021, because it was a year, last year's recommendation, you can imagine uh, how uh, often this uh, was uh, identified uh, in uh, real uh, world audits. Secure configuration. Every system must be configured properly to minimize the attack surface. Something really common, uh, really uh, not something new, but again, a lot of attacks come from poor configuration, from default uh, admin consoles, from default uh, username and passwords that make uh, from unnecessary services that are open to uh, the rest uh, of uh, uh, the network that uh, make the attack surface bigger and more vulnerable to cyber attacks. User awareness and training. Uh, it has been mentioned before, uh, we need to train the users, which are the weakest link. Uh, with multiple awareness activities, I know from uh, my experience with uh, uh, with uh, private maritime sectors, that uh, one of the biggest concerns is how they can train uh, the users uh, that are on board, on vessels, uh, given uh, most of the times uh, they are poor background in handling IT equipment. It is something that uh, requires a lot of effort and we need the multiple awareness activities, not just uh, trivial videos and uh, 10 uh, instructions of uh, how to use the digital assets. Uh, we need the uh, fishing pains. Uh, we need many more to train the users uh, to identify potential threat. Also, what has been also identified, it's not only the, the maritime sector that is uh, suffering from that. The entire security community offer, uh, suffers from the lack of cybersecurity expertise. Uh, even more in maritime sector, there is a misconception that uh, uh, security is part of the overall IT management. Uh, so uh, it is very often uh, that uh, we find uh, uh, security, cybersecurity in maritime as a part of IT, which is something actually that used to happen in uh, other uh, areas uh, as well in the past. However, we need also to explicitly address uh, that and uh, shipping companies would start involving and hiring uh, cybersecurity experts that will uh, uh, fill and address the, the, the security gaps. Last but not least is uh, what we call the security compliance and regulations. Uh, you referred to briefly uh, before, uh, how IMO and uh, regulations uh, can help. Uh, IMO has started in 2017 with the guidelines on maritime cyber risk management. Uh, BIMCO released the guidelines on cybersecurity on board ships. 
uh, both guidelines and IMO used uh, and still use as a reference the ISO 27001 standard and the NIST framework. And um, the main uh, uh, concept and the main uh, recommendation back then was for the shipping company, the shipping industry, the shipping owners to develop a cybersecurity plan. That uh, actually drove to a situation that I can share with you, uh, at least for the last uh, two years, uh, that most of the times part of the audit and the part of what can be could be considered as a successful cyber risk management uh, uh, approach was for each vessel to have a cyber security manual, uh, a manual that uh, included uh, uh, the guidelines that IMO offered, uh, a cyber uh, risk assessment, a risk treatment plan, some recommendations for security controls, but only them, only those were on the manual. Nothing was implemented in real time. And until recently, those, uh, this was uh, uh, conceived, considered by the auditing authorities as something sufficient for uh, a vessel to be cyber security compliant. So my point is that, yes, regulations need to be there. Shipping industry and maritime sector is very sensitive to regulations. This is what has uh, been uh, uh, seen in the past uh, for other areas. However, compliance doesn't mean security. We need to be compliant with the instructions. Regulations are there, but we have to realize that needs that those need to be more than a cybersecurity manual, need to be implemented uh, and applied security controls that will really make sense on uh, mitigating the cyber threats uh, and the impact uh, from uh, in the maritime community. And that actually concludes my presentation. I hope that uh, you heard me well, despite the distance. Thank you very much uh, for your excellent presentation, Isidoros. Uh, I would like to ask uh, our uh, audience if there is any question. Yes, there is, please. Thank you. My name is Luke Helleboger, and first of all, I was very astonished, surprised, that um, I saw uh, the ENISA study for 2011. I was doing the study with Deloitte at that time, and I'm so surprised that still those um, points are not all addressed yet. So thank you, Michael, for bringing them up. Now, my question to EDA is the next. It's about user awareness and training. I, I hear a lot we need and we should do. And sometimes in mankind, we always need a very big catastrophe if something really needs to start moving on, on the terrain. Yeah. So my, my question was about this um, training of people. Um, is there an existing training maritime center already exist, um, ongoing or planned where people could go on the operational level and tactical level to really train hands-on how to secure maritime uh, cyber in a very practical way. We heard today technology is there, processes are there, we have capabilities. So my question is, is, is it existing? And if not, if we should propose from industry a maritime tactical training capability yeah, for Europe, would European Defense Agency support us? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question. I know that uh, for NATO exists uh, that's uh, a maritime specific training center, and actually it is in Crete and in Greece. But the European Union, as far as I know, and uh, focused on defense, there's not something similar to that. Uh, EDA, of course, can support such initiatives and uh, based on uh, how we work uh, in terms of uh, facilitating and enabling uh, research and technology innovation activities, bringing together and working and uh, acting as an interface between industry, academia, RTO and ministries of defense, uh, it is uh, always there is always an opportunity and room for uh, further improvements and investments for that. So yes, it can support that. Uh, I know that there's not any European Union defense for maritime sector uh, specific training center, and uh, you are more than welcome to provide uh, 
recommendations on the ideas on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other question? Not yet. Well, uh, I was just considering uh, recommendations, recommendations, recommendations. That's nice, but uh, I don't know uh, if the if the industry follows it or not. Most probably, yes, it does. But is there a, a participant in the industry who offers a platform or a framework that can be used by any uh, participant of the industry to join the forces and fight together against the cyber attacks? Like, uh, uh, is the question for me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, as far as, as I know, uh, no, there's not such a kind of, uh, of a platform that can be used for everyone. Of course, commercial solutions uh, are there. Uh, we know that uh, big uh, uh, companies, uh, I don't want to name one uh, or two, I don't want to be considered as promoting a specific private sector, but there are solutions that actually integrate uh, the, let's say, traditional cybersecurity uh, solutions into a more tailored environment that could uh, function and work in vessels. We have seen solutions that try to do that. Uh, however, there's not something that can be used as the golden solution and confirm that, yes, we need to do that or we need that platform that is uh, applicable uh, and certified at some point for use in the uh, CPIC industry uh, for vessels and for maritime sector. Uh, as such. Make sense? I think so. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, the question of education uh, popped up uh, several times. Uh, Professor Katsikas, uh, I think that uh, Norway is uh, very advanced in the, in the topic. How do you feel? How could we introduce an um, education system for seafarers uh, related to the cyber uh, issues. We, I don't think that we can uh, teach uh, hundred thousands of, of uh, guys for everything. No, that, that, would not, that would not be feasible and I don't think it is needed anyway because this is the kind of... Well, let me take it from another angle. You know, when, when you speak about human cognition, usually we identify three, uh, three levels in the knowledge continuum. You start with awareness, right? Uh, being, which means being able to answer questions like, what is this about, right? Then uh, you go on with training. And when you're trained, you're able to answer questions of the type, how do you do this? And then the third level in the knowledge continuum is education. Uh, after which, when you're educated, you're supposed to be able to answer questions of the type, why? Now, we don't need really so many thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that are uh, educated in maritime cybersecurity, but we do need trained personnel and we most of all need aware uh, personnel. Now, how can, this, uh, how can this be done? Well, one way is uh, by uh, inviting the industry, because this is not really only a state responsibility. To build up training uh, and awareness, it's mostly training, centers for their staff in the maritime industry. Uh, Isidoro has already mentioned one such, which I believe is of military orientation uh, in Crete, actually. Uh, but uh, such initiatives would be welcome from industry. And in fact, I do remember an initiative back in 2017, so it was the beginning for the cybersecurity. Uh, issues in maritime. When such a training center was uh, announced as a joint initiative between the Tsakos uh, lines in Greece and a major Norwegian uh, industry, actually with presence in many nations, I will not name them of course, but you might guess what it is, that they would start a training uh, center for cybersecurity. But unfortunately, this didn't, uh, didn't, didn't fly. But this is one way of doing it. Now, uh, if you move a bit in the knowledge continuum and you go up to education, well, I guess the, the way to do it 
is to introduce cybersecurity course or courses to those studying marine technology or marine operations. So in the uh, NTNU uh, setting, uh, we would have to uh, somehow introduce courses uh, of cybersecurity into our the, the curricula taught uh, in uh, our uh, Olesund campus, where the maritime uh, maritime industry is. Uh, that would be one way to do it, and of course, to a lesser extent, uh, in size. I mean, uh, inform the curriculum uh, in my own department, which is on information security, on uh, uh, matters of cybersecurity in maritime. But that would have to be. On, uh, on, a, on a different scale and much less, because obviously they would have to be exposed not only to the maritime industry, but also to transportation industry and to uh, power industry and to any type of, of industry uh, you could imagine. But I think, well, I don't think I know, at least in Norway, there is a great demand for master's programs that will produce people that are knowledgeable in both IT and OT cybersecurity. And uh, yeah, that's something I believe that uh, us as educators will have to pay attention to. Is, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Mike, uh, is the curriculum in the States for CIFARS uh, contain some uh, cyber-related education? There, there are a couple of ways to approach this. From the, from the military aspect, of course, you've got the Naval Academy, Navy ROTC uh, programs, officer training in, contained within the public universities, uh, and the Naval and the Coast Guard Academy, uh, Merchant Marine Academy as well. Um, how we go back and recapture uh, the people that already have um, the creds that are working in the industry to get them spun up. Uh, that that's a great question, and I'm not I'm not sure how we would approach that, or even in, how how we would incentivize it. So, see, si, thank you. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, do you have any question for the question? So, thank you very much uh, for uh, our uh, speakers for the contribution. I think uh, we we see the problems. We saw uh, several possible. Uh, scenarios that can happen in the case of uh, in a case, <laughs> and uh, we we saw that uh, there are uh, a way how to solve the problems, and I hope and believe that uh, we it was not an accident that we ended up at the education. I think I'm sure that uh, the weakest link always the the personal and we can harden this weakest link with education, for sure. Uh, I don't know, you might not, not might all of you from the maritime sector, and uh, there was a slight sm uh, smile when the password management was mentioned. Let me come at, uh, with a short story. I was dealing with a, with a simulator, and obviously, who tortured the Estonian keyboard um, on the workshop day can feel my pain, so I, I mistyped the password, obviously. So I contacted the vendor that uh, the, the password doesn't... What is the password? And they wrote, it is in the user's manual, page 57. Page 57, password is there. Cool. Remark. Please don't change this password, because in the case of need, our experts will not be able to help you. Good. So I tried to finish my job, but I failed. So I sent a letter to the vendor. Hey, the password is wrong. OK, try this one. Super admin password. Opens everything. So I think uh, it, was a, it was a good uh, case study to show that uh, there is a nice room for improvement. Gentlemen, thank you for your contribution. Dear Dennis, thank you for your time. Uh, please, uh, I've got, uh, I reserve 51 seconds to hand over a teeny tiny present for uh, presenters. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you very much. I hope and believe that you uh, enjoyed our panel. Please uh, uh, join us uh, today to the dinner. And uh, see you around tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye. All right.